All right, so I'll start with introductions. Um, my name is Caleb Harper. I am a, a research scientist at MIT's Media Lab. I focus on agriculture and agricultural technologies. I think that world is changing so fast, as you may have heard this morning about CRISPR applying to human genome, of course, CRISPR being applied and gene drive and daisy chain and all the things coming off of that into agriculture now, that landscape is shifting quick. I brought uh, two other friends along for the journey with you guys today. So I'll start with Ignacio. Uh, Ignacio is a partner at Flagship Pioneering. Uh, they're a life sciences company traditionally focused on human health uh, and sustainability, and they're managing about $1.8 billion uh, of funds to invest into the space. So he's going to start with a little bit of a kind of panoptic overview of the technologies that he's seeing, why he's choosing to invest, invest in some of them or develop them in-house, um, and then we'll move on with the presentations. Ignacio. Sure. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, so, um, as Caleb mentioned, uh, I am a partner at Flagship Pioneer, and I'm going to tell you some, um, some kind of facts about my background, my journey so far. Uh, I joined Flagship uh, four years ago to lead the agricultural activities uh, at the firm. Uh, and prior to Flagship, I spent time working for Syngenta. I was based in Switzerland. Uh, working on the venture capital group, uh, managing direct investments and indirect investments once Syngenta was looking for innovation. And that was a great, great platform to understand the agricultural landscape. And prior to Syngenta, I spent years working in the human health uh, ecosystem. Um, so there are a few key learnings that I learned at Syngenta. Um, one, uh, the world needs a lot of innovation related to improving food, and food security is a major issue. Uh, two, there are a lot of technologies that can be translated from the human health space into the agricultural space, uh, and, and that has been lagging. Uh, three, uh, the landscape uh, in the startups ecosystem in agriculture is very, very different than in other industries. You can talk, talk about software, IT, human health, uh, and there are different reasons why that's happening. One is there are not many agricultural entrepreneurs, there are not many... Uh, successful exits, there are not many VCs uh, investing in the space. Now that is changing uh, for good reasons. Uh, so that led me to leave Syngenta and, uh, um, and see these problems as a huge opportunity. Uh, and so I joined Flagship, but when we do at Flagship, as, as Caleb explained a little bit, was is basically to think about different spaces and industries and think about how we can create companies that can be very disruptive. Uh, we have financial resources uh, to do that. We have a team that we have built over the years that is basically geared and wired to think creatively about the future. Uh, we are trying to bring the future, the future uh, forward and develop these technologies in-house. We don't wait for people to come into, in, into Flagship and pitch their ideas. We do that as well. Uh, but most of what we do is basically create companies uh, in, 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 different, in different industries. So we focus on... Uh, what we call human health, and uh, we have been very strong and successful over the years in creating revolutionary companies there. Uh, the other aspect that we started four years ago was what we call planet health, which is improving um, uh, sustainability. And, and when we talk about that, we have done energy and water in the past, but we have been focused in this during the last four years in, in agriculture. And we also like to connect these two pieces and work around the intersection between food, uh, agriculture, food and human health, and how this uh, can be um, uh, impacted in a, in a way that we are more efficient, not only creating food, but also uh, impacting food nu uh, nutrition and health and in improving healthcare uh, over the years. Uh, so specifically in agriculture, uh, what we have done um, and the space that we are looking at are uh, biologicals, are, are uh, data, obviously, and, and how digital, uh, digital technologies are, gonna, are going to revolutionize agriculture. Uh, we look at CRISPR systems and ways where uh, you can develop new seeds that are, are or potentially could be uh, better accepted by consumers, and this is a very important aspect. We are trying to find technologies that are, or develop technologies that are really good from a kind of environmental perspective, but we also like to think about the intersection or, or the whole value chain from the very beginning of research, uh, of biological crop protection solutions, seed solutions, digital solutions, and the end consumer, and how we can bre break this kind of long value chain. And uh, there are a lot of inefficiencies there, right, but Ignacio. also... 
You know, it's Chief raising sure. perspectives. But you have to you have to blow their mind with some of the stuff that you're you're supporting lately because I'm sure. totally interested in in that. So if we could talk a little bit about sure. about microbiome of seeds and what's going on with that and how that might change agriculture. So the first thing that we did uh, was uh, develop a technology platform uh, to understand how microbes can influence plant, influence plant health, and these are really good example of translating uh, learnings and experiences the firm had in the human health space and translate them into the agricultural space. So we had one company called Cells Therapeutics that was the first uh, company uh, developing microbiome-based solutions for human healthcare. And we asked ourselves the question where that platform could be applied. Uh, so we looked at agriculture. Uh, we found that there were tremendous opportunities in, and there was, it was a wide space in, in looking at microbes that live within the plant. Uh, uh, we started a company called Indigo Agriculture four years ago uh, with that hypothesis of the microbes that, that live within the, the plant because of plant breeding, traditional plant breeding approaches were kind of removed from, from, from the plants. And what we are doing is basically trying to bring back uh, natural microbes that are really good for plants to uh, cope with abiotic stresses, drought, uh, salt stress, and, and nitrogen use efficiency, etc. So. That company is, is super exciting. We have one co product on the market. We have, sorry, two products on the market. One is for cotton drought stress. Uh, we published the results last week, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we planted this first product in 50,000 acres in cotton in the US, and the yield was, on average, 10% uh, yield increase, which was a phenomenal result. So that's one example of things we are doing on the microbiome. Another example is the intersection between data and, and, and plant sciences. We, have, we started a company a couple of years ago called Sibo Technologies, and this company is basically developing a platform that we call computational agronomy. And it's a hybrid between a ro very robust crop model system that have been developed over the, over the years, and we plug in big data, artificial intelligence, and, and, and other technologies uh, to make what we want to create is basically an, an, a virtual agricultural system. Okay, so I'm gonna keep the data conversation going on ag with a little bit of work that I do, and we wanna leave enough time for you guys to ask questions because there's so much stuff up here you probably haven't seen before. Um, so I kind of position our work and some of the work that's going on um, in terms of movements, and you know, I come from the Media Lab, not a normal place that's doing biology, um, but in the last about three years, there's been six out of the 30 labs singularly focused on biology, synthetic biology, and engineering. So if you follow kind of these movements, coder movement, maker movement, network movement, I believe we're in the middle of kind of biology, uh, a new access to biology through digital technology. So that's bringing a lot of people out of field into the space. These are the two basic parts of my work, um, and we'll talk about how they, how they might integrate, but I'll go through it rather quickly. One is, uh, production platforms. So what you're seeing now is on the facade of the Media Lab. And if you know about the genome or genetics, I'm talking about the phenome or phenotypic expressions or climate in the case of ag. So inside of these boxes, we create climates. We design them with a certain amount of CO2 and O2 and temperature and nitrogen and phosphorus and bacteria and microbes to grow plant expressions. When people say, I love the tomato in Tuscany on the north side of the slope, what they really mean is I love the variables in the climate that causes the gene expression of flavor. Inside of this lab, we're working on decoding plants and decoding their ability to produ produce flavor and nutrition. We take all of that data and we correlate it to what we call a recipe. So there's a ton of sensors inside of this. See that blue line? Imagine that blue line is 1982 Napa and you're trying to produce the perfect Cabernet. You can literally replay the climate reproduce the plant expressions in those specific genetics to basically take down the wine market. So all of that data is translated to the individual plant, all the plants next to it. We experiment with irrigation technologies, growing, in this case, using no water, uh, using no water, using no soil, very little water, about 90% than you would use in the field to produce plants about five times faster. We grow ancient and rare genetics. These tomatoes are an example of tomatoes that hadn't been grown in 150 years. They were accessed out of Svalvord's rare seed bank. So we have a genetic diversity across the world that most of us, no one in this room has ever eaten these tomatoes. Uh, and I can guarantee that there are only about four types uh, that you've eaten in your life. And so there are 10,000 to 100,000 left to be discovered. We're also doing work on textiles, which we'll mention with Ignacio uh, later. 
I made a very small version of what I do, and it's a hacker maker kit. Uh, we call it the food computer. So the food computer has now gone into classrooms across the country and, and truly across the world. Um, kids are experimenting with climate science. In this case, they were, they were using farmer's almanac data to design the climate of the past. Then they put in data currently to design the climate of the present, and they were projecting the climate of the future to see how would plants grow in those climates in the future. A lot more fun to study climate science when you have a climate at your fingertips. We've expanded that into a new lab at MIT where we're just scaling up the work. More data, more plants. Um, we put all of this out open source, and I'll talk about you know, why we do that, but what we call that is the open phenome. People obviously often say, big data, big data. I want to show you what big data is in my case. In my case, it's climate data. So we have this climate data running every eight seconds combined with all the soil mineral data. So when people are like, terroir, we're, we're designing terroir and learning from existing ones. Bacteria and microbes, what you're seeing here is all the bacteria microbes cultured from the plant from the bottom to the top. You see a ton of it in the root zone uh, of this plant and very little on the surface. That tells you that just like our gut is full of microbes that cause expressions, health, human health, their soil is full of them that cause expressions for the plant. So we're learning about those and sequencing them. The last is we take the plant forward and we do chemistry, analytical chemistry that says what flavor compounds were present, what nutrition compounds were present. We then take it forward and correlate it all. Three and a half million data points per plant, per grow, creates a digital recipe. The digital recipe is fed into our robot, and it runs the climate again and again. We've been doing advanced data science about this to learn about correlations and multi-dimensions between five variables. You know, how would you know which things of all of the variables inside of nature cause the best nutrition? That's what we're trying to figure out with machine learning and AI. I know I'm going super fast. But just want you to know there's things like this that exist in the world that do a million heads of lettuce a week, 365 days a year. There are also facilities for your pharmaceutical needs. This is growing uh, Ebola vaccine, so off of a plant-based derivative. So you're talking about the disruption of pharma, cosmetics, nutraceuticals, and food. It's all open source because we need a ton of information to learn anything about this. And I'm following, obviously, some interesting precursors um, in my space. We launched this out all open source. We created a Reddit-style community you can go to. And now, in the last four months, we're in 20 countries on six continents. They're calling themselves homebrew food computer clubs. If that sounds anything familiar to people in the audience, they're doing this because they're curious, because they're excited, and because science is so open in the space for disruption with digital tech. I'll skip that. So the last thing that we're doing, and this goes directly to you, this is the world now. You're seeing the world farm. Any country with a color is food insecure. Any country that is both colored and purple is producing food for another country and sending it across their borders. These, this is how food is distributed. This is our global farm. We're trying to now disrupt that with technologies like the next one that we're going to talk about. In-field data technologies that give us a ton of data paired with plant data. So we can say, hey, in Peru, in the summertime, you should have planted this cultivar of bean because it would have given you the best protein. So with that, I'll turn it over to Farmers Business Network. All right. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, we need to plug you in. Why don't I give you a little bit of an intro then? So Farmers Business Network, one of the coolest things and one of the things I'm most excited about in the space, taking farmers' data, but not taking it, partnering with them to be able to leverage it and hedge it themselves. So they're creating data sets that have never existed before. They had more data in the first, uh, first few years than the USDA ever had digitized. Um, this is now 11 million acres. She's probably going to, you're going to talk about that, <laughs> Elizabeth, yes. um, of how fast it's moving. So we'll see if, you know, her Mac wants to log in. There we go. Good morning. So lots to talk about in a very short period of time. I'm just going to describe very briefly what we do and share a couple of concepts that hopefully will allow for a little discussion today and then ongoing over the next couple of days. Um, my background quickly is as an investor in the energy and agriculture spaces. Um, and then I transitioned over to the operating side now with a few different companies in consumer tech, health and wellness, and food production. I was introduced to Farmers Business Network a few months ago and joined the team 
mostly because I am incredibly excited about what we've done on behalf of the farmer. And I believe the farmer and the consumer are actually very well aligned in what they want from the food system. And it's about better connecting them uh, through data and network data. So if I only had one slide to share, it would be this one, because this is sort of the, um, the foundation of Farmers Business Network and why we're doing what we're doing. We believe that the farmer is really stuck in the middle of some very large, uh, firmly entrenched, almost monopolistic companies, upstream and downstream. And so as a single individual farmer, you don't have a lot of power in this ecosystem, and we're seeking to change that by networking farmers together. So we have created the largest uh, agronomic network of on-farm data, and by doing this, we are empowering farmers by networking them together, and then helping them to leverage that power in how they transact in these markets, so how they buy their inputs, how they sell their products, and overall just giving them actionable insights uh, to make really critical decisions on farm. And, and think about their farm as a business and about ROI, not just additional yield. And we have committed to them that this would all be done with very independent and unbiased analytics. Um, our commitment to our farmers is that their data is their data. We are just stewards of their data and combining all of that into an anonymized, aggregated format that gives them confidence and, and insights. And also that this would all be powered by real on-farm information and data as opposed to university trials or certain company-sponsored trials that are optimized uh, for ideal conditions. In two years' time, we have uh, we, we just launched the commercial product two years ago, and today we are 3,000 farms strong with over 10 million acres of data. And I think this is an important point, because when we talk about an acre, for us that actually means there are six to seven acre events per acre. So this is a very robust data set, and you probably noticed that Caleb and I are sharing this graphic because it is important um, that this data is, is a very high quality and very substantial. We're able to do this today because so much information is being collected on farm from a variety of different sources. There are many different hardware and software systems and many ag tech companies that are, that are playing an important role in gathering and capturing all this information. What Farmers Business Network has done, which is unique, is to actually be able to collect all of this into one system and provide an overview of what's happening on the farm, but also what is happening on that farm relative to all the farms within a 100-mile radius. And this makes the comparative data and the insights very relevant. And really the goal here is to democratize that information and make it very useful for the farmer. So two quick examples of the power of this networked information. One is around transparency and one is around confidence and the ability to make decisions. And I'm going to use two particular product examples. So price transparency. In working with our growers, we learned that there are very wide, wide price disparities in what they pay for the exact same products. As you can see, there's a range, but at the upper limits, some of these disparities are really wildly substantial. And when we learned this because our growers were actually contributing their price information and their invoices to us so that we could aggregate that and then give them back a view on, well, what are you paying relative to other farmers in your area? And so this was very useful information to arm them with more data so that they could then be better negotiators for the price of their, their inputs. Um, and we've, of course, translated all of this into very user-friendly tools available on mobile. Um, and, and this is a price transparency tool that our farmers have found very useful, especially to the extent that they are saving tens or sometimes even hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in their input costs. Networked information also provides more confidence around decision-making. So if you take, for example, the average FBN farmer 
who has about 2,000 acres. He may have 20 different soil types, uh, or sorry, he may be using, utilizing 12 different seed varieties and maybe managing about 20 different soil types and textures on that farm. In order to test all those combinations and optimize for the right seed choice, which is actually the most expensive input and probably the most important decision that a farmer can make, it would take him 30 years to make a decision like that. But with 10 million acres of data that he has access to now on the FBN platform, he can actually make this decision in real time and we have created tools where he can actually take a look by soil type and in my region, what would be the seed hybrid variety that would actually perform best under those conditions. And now he can make field by field level decisions about the seed type that will perform best uh, within his operation. So really the bottom line is strength in numbers networking these growers together so they have power in how they transact in the markets and also how they make decisions on farm. Um, and at that, I'll turn it over for our discussion. Awesome. So if you guys have any questions, just raise your hand. I think we're going to go around. Um, and until you do, uh, unless that was all too fast, um, I'll start off with a few. Oh, yep, there's one. So if we want to bring, you can just yell it out if you want, make it easy. So how do your yeah, farmers feel? Yeah, for me. Yeah, sure. Well, the farmers... Uh... Oh, the question was, how do the farmers feel about you gathering their data? No. How do the vendors feel? Oh, how does Cargill and Kleiner Perkins and Unilever, how do they feel about you? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think a year ago when we started specifically with the, tri the, the price transparency tool um, and also... Um, offering inputs on our platform for sale. Many of these suppliers um, were concerned about what this could mean. Now that we have networked such a large group together, they actually recognize that this direct-to-farmer model holds a lot of value and that it's probably a very important part of their distribution models in the future. Um, and so those conversations have actually become uh, much more collaborative in terms of how to get uh, more transparently priced and more competitively priced product to farmers. Great. Another question? I, I was born in the US and in Finland, and it's amazing how the quality of food has gone down as the big chains get bigger. So yeah. I think you're doing absolutely amazing things. Is there any way we could help your business to expand globally further? Great question, thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, what we have done is start in the US because I think um, some of these issues around uh, the, the farm getting larger, but still in relative terms, very small compared to these very big companies. Uh, we have started in the US in, in tackling that issue, but we have, um, I think, tremendous opportunity to do this globally. And so for us, it's a matter of prioritizing which of those companies would be first. Um, and that would be a great opportunity for the next few days here to actually have conversations um, with, with individuals from various countries who believe that this model could be very successful there. Um, and it, I would, we would love to have that input. I think also insight. continuing to demand transparency um, from the products that you're taking in. You know, we're learning, you're, you mentioned nutrition. Nutrition has fallen off 50% in the things that we eat in the last 100 years or so. And it's because our supply chains are so long. Now, they were long and fed a lot of people in the meantime, so there was nothing, I think, that was intentionally designed that way. But continuing to demand transparency has changed all the mindsets of the major food companies. So what you've seen over the last year is food companies, big, the big five, take money out of their R&D funds and start venture capital funds, start trying to purchase trust again from consumers. And so I think you know, General Mills has a huge fund, Campbell's has a big fund. Um, they're all trying to search for innovation. So I think I'll ask you a question, Ignacio, because you come from the Syngenta space into uh, kind of the innovation and new company space. When they're starting these funds now, 
Is that what they're looking for? Trust, transparency? What, where are the big targets um, that you think are, are going to affect the future? So I think the interesting thing related to this question and to your, to your question as well about the quality of food and the, the, the value chain, we are, I think, at a very important time in the history of agriculture because we don't have big five now. We have mm -hmm. big three. Dow and Pioneer, Syngenta and ChemChina, and Bayer is now buying Monsanto. So it's even a better time for Farmers Business Network and other companies to try to kind of change the whole landscape because this time of transformation, you have these big companies merging together at the same time. So they are going to be distracted for the next two years, which creates a huge amount of opportunity if you know where to, where to go. Uh, to answer Caleb's question, I think the big companies, not only in ag, but in other industries as well, they are trying to start these corporate venture capital groups. And these corporate venture capital activities go in cycles. Then they start, they spend a few years working on this, and then they disappear. They have, most of them, the idea of, or the main, the main goal is to understand what's going on in the innovation landscape. Uh, they follow or they have different approaches. Uh, you could argue that some of them are, could be more successful than others, but it's having visibility of what's out there. Um, and they set up these venture capital groups uh, with that idea. Well, uh, I think they're trying, you know, trying to see things ahead of time like Blue Apron. I mean, Blue Apron has blown up in the last three years, does a billion dollars in revenue, and is valued at $2 billion. This is a company that delivers cut food to your house, prepped for you to make a recipe and cook your own food in the US. I mean, they have now an integrated supply chain back to the farm. That's how quickly things are moving. So I think taking advantage of the networked landscape is something that agriculture hasn't ever done. It's been an industrial technology, an industrial Absolutely. economy, and it still very much is. So bringing that kind of disruption is making huge things happen pretty fast. Does anyone else have questions? Um, it's really fascinating what you're doing. Um, I have one question because I think this is also a unique chance for environmentally friendly farming because through in empowering the farmers, you can um, maybe also convince them to act more environmentally friendly. Yes, I agree with that. Do you see any opportunities for that? Is there a question? Yeah. So I, I, think it is, I think it is an opportunity, and I think that um, one opportunity we have is for growers who want to experiment with other more resource-friendly options around their inputs, whether it's biologicals or... Um, different irrigation techniques, this system allows them to maybe experiment and compare, right, and start to take those risks in their operation, but take those risks in a way in which they can really assess and perhaps start at small scale on a portion of the farm and compare to the rest of the farm and then make those changes over time. So I think it does create the platform that, that really allows for that and hopefully that we can make that transition. And I think I would add one thing about the sustainability aspect, we should also think very about the future and if there are crops that should be grown in an indoor environment. Yeah. Uh, there, are grow, there are areas in the world where we are growing vegetable crops and there, is problem, there are problems with water and there are problems from a sustainability standpoint. And we should be thinking about solutions and, and this is again a great opportunity to think about can we grow these crops in a sustainable way, in a controlled way where you reduce the cost of logistics, the cost of inputs and make, it, make them even more nutritious. So there are a lot of, I think, opportunities to help farmers ex that exist today but also create more farmers and, and make them more su successful. Well, and I think to change the view on food from, it's been yield, yield, yield. Like, you know, there's only been one GMO ever for nutrition it's called golden rice, and it's like within the last few years. There's been one ever for flavor. It's called the flavor saver tomato, and it died out real fast. So as we start focusing, this, changing the focus from yield, yield, yield to how good is it for me? How good is it? Can I trust it for my children? And will it be around when they have children? That really changes what the optimization factors are. Um, we maybe have time for one last question. Nope. No more questions. So those really good questions you that you have, question. we'll have to address after the panel. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.